My painting will have to tell many stories. It should be large enough to hold everything. Sveiki visiem, gan tiem, kas tiko atnākuši, gan arī tiem, kas bija jau uz iepriekšējo lekciju. Mums šovakar Splendid Palace noteikti trīs WordPress foto šī gada konkursa uzvarētāju lekcijas. Un šīs lekcijas ir daļa no Borisa un Ināra Tetareus fonda atbalstītās mākslas programmas TETA-TET, kuras video rullīt jūs tiko redzējāt. Tiko mums uzstājās Pols Hansens, un nākamais runātājs būs Dāņu un fotožurnālists Jāns Grarups, kurš šogad ieguva pirmo balvu Wellpress foto konkursā sporta kategorijā ar stāstu par sieviešu basketbola komandu Somālijā. Un šī bija jau astotā Wellpress foto balva Jāna Grarupa karjerā. Un savas karjeras laikā viņš ir ceļojis pa visu pasauli, veidojot reportāžus no dažādiem karstajiem punktiem. Un saņēmis par to daudz apbalvojumus, un viņa darbi arī ir publicēta ļoti bieži starptautiskos uzdevumos dažādos. Tā kā es aicināšu tagad Jānu. Thank you for the invitation. Which one is it? This one. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, let me start by saying I am not a sports photographer. <laughs> Actually, this is the first time I did sports in my entire life, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really have a clean desk on my laptop either. Uh, you have to bear with me with that. Um, this is the second time I'm here. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that there were not very many questions for Paul. Um, because last time I was here, there was quite a few, actually. And I hope we can have some kind of dialogue, uh, because uh, one of the important things about photography is not just the pictures, but it's also the talks about photography and what it means to us as photographers, but also to the people who are viewing it. So, uh, you know, please, if you, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them, right? And also, I can't speak for an hour and a half. So. It, I'm kind of, uh, it's kind of important. Um, I'll just make a short introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Danish, uh, 45 years old. I've been working as a photographer for more than 20 years now. Uh, I used to work as a staff photographer for a major newspaper in Denmark. And uh, in many ways, just like Paul, uh, we did a lot of the same things. However, uh, at some point, I didn't feel that I was doing what I really needed to do with my photography. Uh, the important stories became less and less, and the day-to-day -day jobs at the newspaper became too overwhelming for me, so I had to quit in order to pursue uh, the goals and the stories that I really wanted to do. And I have, a v I have very, very big respect for newspaper photographers who are able to reinvent themselves every day going going to the, to the newspapers and do assignments on a daily basis and continue doing good stories. And for instance, in Paul's case, even more interesting that he's able to actually do 
important photojournalism in Sweden because I was never able to do that in Denmark. I always felt I was just photographing stupid stuff in Denmark. So eventually I, I just left the business of newspaper photography. Uh, a few years, or actually six, seven years ago now, I was the co-founder of Noor Images, uh, which is based in Holland. Uh, a collective of photographers, we were 10 photographers who went uh, together and created Noor. Uh, where we were working on larger scale projects, uh, stories uh, as group projects, etc. And I really enjoyed uh, the company of Noir. It's uh, photographers I have, uh, you know, very, very much respect for. Uh, but again, at a, at, a, at a point a few years back, I felt that I was spending too much time trying to be a manager of an office uh, and not too much energy or focus on actually taking pictures. So I left Noor again um, in order to try and, and focus my work even more uh, than, than what I was able to do. Uh, my main subjects around the world is I'm uh, in many ways like Paul, I'm a war photographer, catastrophes, uh, photographer uh, taking pictures in, in areas around the world which for me is uh, not just interesting but also important stories to tell. And all, almost all my stories start with a personal interest in the subject. Uh, it starts with me being curious to a subject. It's very, very rare that I go on assignment which is, uh, which is given to me and where I don't have a personal interest in it, uh, which also makes it slightly more difficult to make money. So let's just kill one thing at, you know, to begin with, which is that because you are what you would call a fairly uh, well-known, internationally acclaimed photojournalist does not mean that you are a millionaire. I can, I can promise you that for sure. Uh, especially not when you are allowing yourself to, to say no to assignments, which I do. Um, if I don't have a, my heart and my mind in the story, I would most likely let the story go to someone else. Uh, which also means that I have changed my... Uh, the people that I work for quite a lot. I used to work a lot with, uh, with Newsweek, uh, with Stern magazine in Germany, with many other international uh, publications. Uh, but in, in, in these days where the assignments are going down, the interest in the stories that I'm doing is going down dramatically. Uh, I've been working more and more with NGOs and with organizations who are, are helping around the world. And then I'm doing exhibits, uh, books. Right now I'm doing two books, which is also what I will show you tonight. Um, and again, uh, on a longer scale, I, I'm working on various subjects, which I will also show you a little bit uh, of, and, and also tell you a little bit about how I actually find the subjects that I want to take pictures of. Um, four years ago, uh, we in Noor started a project called Consequences, which was related to the climate changes around the world. We, all, all ten of us, traveled the world uh, trying to document how climate changes are, are uh, influencing our lives. Uh, and at that point I went to, uh, to the Horn of Africa, to Somalia, and to the border because there was a very big drought on, on its way. Uh, not the first one, there's been several of them. Uh, but another one was coming. And like always, what we do in the Western world is that there is a lot of organizations who are telling us that something bad is going to happen, but we don't really react. They are actually begging for help before it happens because they know it will happen. And uh, the Western world is a very arrogant place, so we don't really react until we see a lot of small, dead black children lying in the streets because eventually it becomes reality. The famine will strike. Uh, famines are not uncommon in Africa, uh, weather changes, but right, what is happening right now is that climate changes are making the drought seasons longer and longer in Africa. Uh, and uh, it makes a lot of people move. They, they, they change directions more than they've done before. And when you have a country like Somalia, which has been in war for the last two decades, it makes the problem even worse. 
And this was the story that I decided to do, to document for the consequences show. People who are trying to leave the Horn of Africa because of the drought. And I did. And um, I investigated the story a lot, which is also what a lot what photographers do. We kind of investigate our stories before we actually do them. And it turned out that uh, according to a UN estimate, uh, by the year 2050, there will be more than 50 million climate-related refugees trying to leave Africa. That's an estimate. And for me, that was actually the kickstart, the real kickstart to the story, because I was thinking about my own country, Denmark, and Europe in general, uh, knowing that none of these people would get into Europe. We don't want them. Uh, so where should these people go? And for me, that's an interesting subject or an interesting topic to raise that we have to deal with on a longer term. What should these people do if we can't help them in their, in their close areas? Um, and once I started this story and went to Somalia and, f and listened to all these uh, testimonies on how Fa fathers were trying, they started or decided to leave their areas because their camels died, not because their children died, because their camels died, that scared them. Uh, because then it was getting serious. Uh, I decided to continue working in Somalia and uh, what I'm doing this year is I'm uh, doing a book called Caught Between War and Famine, which is basically about the civilian population in Somalia, how they are caught either in uh, drought-related situations or the fight between religious extremists and an inspiring uh, democracy and warlords and how, as always, it's the civilian population who are suffering. And this is what the book will be about. So I will show you 10 minutes now of the book. It's a little bit long edit. Actually, it should have been cut down a little bit, but that's one of the things that I'm working on right now is the final edit of the book. Um, and inshallah, it will be out sometime this year. But it will be about 10 minutes, and then we can uh, do some Q&A after that, if I can get the computer to work.
Well, that was some of the Somalia work. And, you know, obviously what happens when you are working on a story like this is that uh, the further you get into the story, the more complex the story turns out to be. Uh, and the story that won in the World Press this year was the story about the women playing basketball, which was a story that I came upon, I stumbled upon while doing the, the larger story. Uh, I heard about these women playing, uh, and you have to realize that that these women are threatened every day by the Al Shabaab militias because they are breaking all the Sharia laws in the country. They are women; they are not wearing uh, anything, uh, scarves or whatever, and they are playing sports. And uh, they are threatened by text messages every day. You know, the the woman that I followed the most, uh, Suez. She would receive text messages on her phone saying, you are wearing this and this clothes, you are on this bus, we will kill you, we will kill your family. Uh, so it had a lot of consequences for the women. And basically, you know, all they wanted was to play basketball and they wanted to, to, uh, to decide for themselves whether it was right or wrong. And at the same time, they were threatened by all these uh, militant uh, radical Islamist groups. And for me, it became interesting, or the most interesting part of it was that they were actually fighting for something completely different than just basketball. They were fighting for, for female rights in the country at the same time. And uh, it's by far some of the strongest women I've met anywhere in the world, and I really admire them. Which is also why the award that I was given by World Press, the 1500 euros, uh, I donated to the girls. And then I make it a collection uh, through Facebook and all the social medias where we actually managed to collect another 5,000 euros. 
So, uh, so we, can, we are able to give them 6,500 euros when I go back very soon. And they don't know it. And it's, it's the same as, it's the, the equivalent of 10 years salary for the girls. Just in order for them to actually being able to co continue playing basketball. Uh, and even more important, to buy security for when they are practicing. And this story also took me to many outskirts of the country. I went, of course, to the big refugee camps in Kenya. I went to the refugee camps on the Ethiopian border, which is really difficult because Ethiopian people in general are pricks and they don't like, uh, they don't like media and especially not in their border areas. Uh, so I had to go there as a uh, communication officer for an, for an organization just to be able to photograph there. But there are some very, very large camps there, and it's highly under-told stories. I also went all the way up to the Horn, the actual Horn up to Posaso, which is like cowboy town number one in the world. Uh, and that's where a lot of the refugees who were trying to escape over the Bay of Aden into Yemen are actually located. Uh, and every month, more than 15,000 people are trying to get into Yemen. A lot of them are thrown overboard by the smugglers in the middle of the night when they are uh, passing over. Others, again, uh, reach the shore. A lot of the women are taken hostages or bushwives by the smugglers afterwards in Yemen and end up being uh, molested sexually uh, in, in uh, something that you could compare to prisons uh, in Yemen. Uh, so it's, it's a really, really bad situation in many ways and in many aspects. Also you have, I mean, the, 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 the soldiers, the TFG soldiers who are, uh, who are known as government soldiers are really, really aggressive. They, they chew a lot of cat every day. So they are high on this cat thing, uh, and uh, they abuse and molest uh, a lot of the, the, the female refugees uh, because there's no light in the camps at night, so they are just attacked. So there's a lot of gender, uh, gender violence there as well. So, so for me, there's many different aspects to the story and to the book about Somalia that I want to raise uh, questions about. And again, you have a country which have gone through two decades of war, but at the same time there is a, there's a growing uh, or an attempt to implement democracy on a very, very low scale right now. But they are trying to, and uh, it's, it's a really, really interesting story. Any questions to this? Huh? No? Nothing about democracy? Jesus Christ, yeah. Good question. Yeah, I have bodyguards. I have eight bodyguards around me all the time when I'm there. Eight. Um, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult place to work for many reasons. One being that it is by far one of the most dangerous countries in the world. And uh, I can say that without blinking because I've traveled in all these countries. Uh, everything from Iraq to Afghanistan to Somalia to whatever, Chechnya, whatever you can think of, I've been there. Uh, and Somalia in specifically, uh, specifically is very dangerous because there are hardly any white NGOs working there due to the risk of either being kidnapped or due to the Al-Shabaab militias, the radical Islamists who just want to kill you. Uh, a few years back there was a, a Swedish uh, photographer, Martin Adler, who was killed during a rally in, in Mogadishu. Many other journalists have been killed. Uh, last year alone 22 local journalists were killed because the Al-Shabaab doesn't like them either. So there is a, there's many attacks going on. Uh, there are random killings, assassinations, a lot of suicide bombs. And it's on a daily, it's on a daily basis. You ju we just don't hear about it in the Western world unless it's something completely spectacular. And for that reason, all the NGOs, the white NGOs, have uh, withdrawn. Red Cross, uh, Red Crescent, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, all of them has left, at least the, the, the white staff has left, and then it's, they handed out some of the jobs to local NGOs, but not in, the, not in the way that you would imagine. 
so when I'm working there, I need eight bodyguards. And if, if, uh, if it's a really bad period, sometimes we go up to 12 or 16. Uh, that means we drive in three cars uh, with armed, all these armed guys around. Uh, and also it costs a lot of money. I'm paying normally about $1,500 a day just in security. And since I don't have any sponsors, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a substantial amount of money to just be there for 10 days, you know, putting up $15,000 in security. But more importantly, it makes it very, very difficult to work uh, because some of the things that are important in, in my line of work is, of course, the intimacy with the people that I photograph, the trust, uh, the ability to have time with them so they get to know me and trust me. And it's really, really hard to do with eight armed guys on your shoulders. So, you know, through all the different, the, the different trips and journeys I had there, you know, I kind of got into a system where, you know, they would keep like 30, 50 meters away from me. And then instead of just protecting me, they would secure an area. And then we just pray that things will go well. But it is a very difficult place to work and by far one of the most difficult places I've tried. Well, I mean, it, it's already split into three countries, Somaliland and Puntland and, and Somalia. Uh, the big problem in the country is that, democ I mean, democracy is not something to take for granted. You know, you have to learn democracy. Democracy is not something, I mean, many of us in the Western world, in Europe, take it for granted. And you shouldn't, because it's, it's a really tricky thing to understand, especially if you're used to corruption. <laughs> it's really difficult. Um, so there's just been a <coughs> well the solution is that that you try that you try to actually implement it now there's a new government in place now which is the mo the less corrupt government of all times in the country hopefully that process will will solve some of the problems that will get to another level but there's no short term solution it, it it's a long process and it, the, the process is, is by giving people an understanding that warlords will not solve it. Uh, you know, handing over the power to a few people who would put half of the money in their pockets is not the solution. The solution is to actually work through the situation. And it is possible, it is doable, but it just takes time and, and people have to learn it. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like everywhere else, it's, it's you know, if I'm sure that I would be a millionaire tomorrow if I could solve this problem, because you know that would make it's like a traffic jams. If you can solve that problem, you could be a millionaire as well, right? And and it's a, it's just a very very long process. And finally, event, you know, finally it's going in the right direction step by step. But I mean, the day that the new president was put in the office, there was four suicide attacks on him, the very day. So, you know, and, and, and like I said, the, the National Army is put together by different warlords who were pissed off with the Al-Shabaab who took control of the country. So they, for, for once, they joined forces to kick the Al-Shabaab out. Now the Al-Shabaab is gone. They are starting to position themselves again in terms of getting the power back in the country, you know? But it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful country, it's a wonderful people, very, very um, full of empathy, full of uh, hospitality. I mean, they are not the ones fucking this up, it's the few. And, uh, and it's, it's a beautiful place, huh? the lobster bar on the beach there, could be a, they could make millions in tourism, much more than Kenya. Just need someone to get rid of all the guns, and you know, <laughs> the problem is like 90% of the people in the country have guns, right? And and Somalias, Somalis in general, are are so so. I mean, they are all suffering from mental traumas due to war. So whenever a bomb explodes in the streets where everybody else would hide, Somalis they just pick up their own guns and go out with the guns. So all of a sudden, there's like not 10 guns, there's 400 guns. You know, that's kind of the solution. 
So at that stage, someone should go out in the street, someone like me, and say, put away the guns, let's talk about it. <laughs> huh? Do you do it? No, Jesus, I mean, they would shoot me on the spot. <laughs> it has to be someone local. <laughs> Why do you take black and white pictures? I mean, a lot of my work is black and white because I'm distracted by color. Uh, first of all, I'm a very, very lousy color photographer. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. I'm really, really bad with colors. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like sugar and uh, dynamite with me and colors in the camera. That's also why I actually have a black and white camera. It doesn't have color in it. <laughs> um, no, the reason why I shoot in black and white is, for me, it kind of simplifies the message a lot. Uh, colors seem to uh, distract a lot of my work. You know, a blue sky, a red shirt, you know, especially in a place like Somalia where the women are extremely beautifully uh, dressed, you know, very powerful uh, colors. So if I'm trying to, to simplify something serious, it's all, it's all in, the, in the faces and the emotions in the faces, and it's so much easier to actually see in black and white than in color, because color is just distracting. So that's the main reason for me to do it. It, it makes it, 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 makes it e much easier and much simpler to actually to read the picture or to understand the picture. But it's also a problem. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I think it's in Norway, most uh, f editors or newspapers, they say the, the, color, the world is in color, so, so should the pictures. So why do you shoot in black and white? Well, you not so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting, and I understand it because, you know, in, in these days where we are talking about manu you know, manipulation in, 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 in photography, you know, is it manipulating the, uh, the, real, uh, the, the real message in a picture by doing black and white? I mean, some would argue that it is. Um, and I remember I did a book some years back from Darfur, a very, very large project, and I was actually interviewed uh, while doing it uh, on CNN, uh, while I was in Darfur. And I showed, that was actually when I started the project, so a lot of the work was in color, and there was this amazing picture with a lot of colorful dresses and a blue sky and people waiting in line for food. And then this stupid anchor woman on CNN called it a fashion conflict because of all the beautiful dress, and I was just like stunned on live TV, and I was like, excuse me, what did you call it? And she called it a fashion conflict, so I went straight back home to the place that I lived and converted all the pictures into black and white. <laughs> Anyone else? Wait. Uh, the women's basketball team, do, the, do they know that you won the award? No. And they don't know that I'm bringing in uh, 6,500 euros uh, either. But, you know, my fixer, the guy who's doing, who's in head, uh, head of all my security and all my stuff uh, related to, to my work in Afghanistan, sorry, in, in Somalia knows. Do you think it might uh, change somehow? I mean, there every day. I, I mean, obviously the money will change a lot. But again, you know, I really have to be careful not to screw this up because if, if it's, if it's well known that, that these girls are receiving all this money, it could be potentially dangerous to them. That's why I'm having my fixer help me out with this so I don't do something stupid. And at the same time, I, I've been through this as well, is that the fact that the women have been exposed much more now because of my story, if that could actually create some problems for them. Uh, because, you know, for sure that's, that's not the intention with it, but it could potentially be the situation. However, you know, I explained it to them when I did the story. I explained to them that, that I was doing a story for a larger scale audience and uh, that this would be seen by many. And, uh, and Suvez, who is, I mean, she's only 19 years old, right? She said, well, what can they do? They can only kill me once and they're threatening me every day. Okay, that's an answer. So, so she was very aware of it. I mean, she was threatened anyway, so, yeah. 
Okay, my question. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about circulation. It's about selling magazines, right? And uh, a clever man once said that uh, a country ha has the magazines and newspapers it deserves. If, and if that's the truth, you know, we are really fucked uh, in, in many countries, you know. That's, that's a big problem. But at the end of the day, magazines and newspapers, they are putting the news in, the, in, in their magazines, whatever, because they think it will actually either sell them or it's the stories that we are interested in. And, and, I, f and I feel completely opposite with that, you know. Um, I remember not too many years ago, I did stories for Stern where we had several stories from Africa on a yearly basis. Now they would tell me, well, we can only have one African story a year, for instance. And, and that's not that has nothing to do with what kind of story it is. It's, it's, it's just a mere fact that one story with black people a year, that's enough, you know? And, and that's also why, I've, you know, I tried to, to, to dedicate my job in other directions. I'm, I'm a very big uh, spokesman for, for social media. I use Facebook a lot, I use Twitter a lot. I put a lot of my work online and I get a lot of response through that as well much more than, than I imagined, and much more than I would get when, when I was working in, in, uh, in uh, printed media. And the only thing which is different is that the people that I'm addressing now are the ones who are actually interested in these kinds of stories. The, I mean, we are finding each other, but on different platforms, which is very interesting. Uh, so I'm not I'm not belonging to one of these uh, to this group of photographers who are scared about sharing my work on on uh, on internet. Uh, not at all. Through that, I actually meet a lot of people who are supporting my work. Uh, for instance, they supported uh, collecting money for the basket players in in, in Somalia. And also, uh, in in as I said, it's really expensive to work in Somalia. So. So I have several times used crowdfunding to, to actually support the project, which also means, and this is the commercial, ta-da, I'm dancing. Now it's the commercial break. I brought some prints here, which are for sale. And these print sales will, all of them, be directed straight back into the story, which is basically that people who are supporting the story, instead of just giving me money, they receive a signed print. And this money is generated back into the project so I can actually continue and finish the book so it can be put on the street, right? So it's a kind of interaction in terms of how you can, you can progress with the work, how you can actually continue developing your work and, not being, and, and, and without, being, uh, uh, without having to go through magazines or whatever to, to try and persuade them to actually do a story that they basically are not really interested in. You know? So it's, it's, it's kind of a new way of thinking. Yeah. Oh, it's a very, very interesting question that we could talk about all night long. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that democracy would work uh, everywhere. Uh, but, but then again, you know, if you look at Europe, you know, from a historical point of view, it took many years to implement democracy in Europe as well, right? It, it, it didn't just come overnight. And by far, uh, democracy is not something that you can implement by military force. It has, to, it has to start somewhere, it has to come from somewhere. So, so how, how you can, I mean, I'm sure that there's a long way also in Afghanistan in terms of, of uh, democracy. Once the ISAF forces are pulling out, it will be chaos again, for sure.
So, so you know, so that, that it's not the solution. I mean, the Kasai government is completely corrupt. Everybody knows that. Look at Kasai's uh, villas in Pakistan. And right now you have all the uh, Talibans jumping on the border in Pakistan, just waiting for the uh, ISAF forces to leave so they can move in big time again. So it's, it's a very, very long process. But the best thing to do is, you know, I would, I, had I, had, if I had had anything to say, I would have said instead of doing a, a military intervention the way that we did, which was, you know, to begin with, not about implementing democracy. It was about catching Osama bin Laden, right? Um, you know, it would have been better to, to, cry, to try and create some kind of uh, common ground for people to discuss the, 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 the tribal leaders, the warlords, you know, to try and get some kind of understanding through them for them to understand each other more than just putting in 200,000 troops. Yeah. So it's, 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 I mean, again, I don't have the solution. And I'm not sure that it's possible to implement democracy everywhere. I do know that implementing democracy takes a hell of a time. And that's what's what we, we've been through in, in Europe. And uh, as I said, it's not something that is learned overnight. Well, I mean, they. Well, I mean, first of all, they are hired by my fixer. I don't hire them myself because there's been many incidents of journalists or NGOs who have been taken cap or been captured by their own security. Uh, because they get a, got a better offer, you know. <laughs> so it's 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 a it's a question about sales. At the end of the day, who 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 has the better price? Uh, but they do work for. Uh, I mean, Turkey has has uh, Turkey has been involved in Somalia for quite a while. It used to be an Italian colony, and now Turkey kind of took over that role because they want to be an international key player, and they, they kind of put their love in Somalia. So, so they are there with quite a few NGOs and, and, and different people working there. Then you have Somali, uh, foreign Somalis, I mean, people who lived in London or in Denmark, in Norway. Norway have a big Somali community, just like Denmark and, and England. And they come back to try and invest and create some kind of business there because they see potential, uh, even though it's, it's far away. So they work for them as well because they are, they are at risk as well. I mean, generally, all everyone who are not a fundamentalist are in danger, also locals. So, you know, parliamentarians, uh, uh, musicians are in danger, journalists, everyone, businessmen. So, you mean they're gardening so much all the time? Oh, yeah. yeah. But not at the same price, because I'm white, you know, the prices go up. No, I mean, $1,500 uh, a day is, is not a bad income, but, but someone owns these guys. I mean, they are probably paid $5 a day. I mean, someone is the boss of these guys who has the cars and the guns and the uniforms, and he's the one making money, which is my fixer, Bashir. He's the rich guy. They, they don't get rich. And it's the same with, with the pirates, you know, with piracy in Somalia. It's, it, it's not the pirates who get rich. It's the local government or the governor of an area who are in charge of what is happening. They are the ones making the money, not, not the regular people. They're just fishermen who can't fish anymore. How do you handle fear? If you have fear? Well, I mean... I guess I should be f afraid more than I, I am, but I'm not. I mean, it's, uh, I, I spoke to, to, to Stefan a lot this morning about it. I don't know, at some, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years, and at some point it kind of changed, and now I don't give a shit. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm diagnosed post-traumatic traumatic stress. I'm eating medication against it. Uh, I believe a lot in the work that I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not I'm implying that I'm can, I can change the world, but I do hope that my work can actually make people reflect upon a lot of stories, right? 
and also I hope that my work can, I mean, for me, good photojournalism should not answer questions, it should raise questions, right? And the stories that I'm doing are all stories that I'm really interested in myself personally and very, you know, really dedicated to. And, and unfortunately, these stories take me places which is dangerous. And it's not really that important that it's dangerous to me because I'm kind of deciding this myself. But fear I haven't really had for a very, very long time. And that's not because I'm, a, you know, it's, it's not to sound heroic or anything like that at all. Um, I just don't feel it that way anymore. There was a question up here? Yeah, it was a question also about the fear. How do you cope with that? But I heard the answer. But Medicine. Yeah. <laughs> but and then, drugs. But uh, then I will make a comment. Um, because uh, after a pause, a presentation, I was thinking about uh, why uh, there were no answers, and I also questions, uh, because it kind of struck you, the way you see like uh, the war and everything, and you see a lot of these pictures, and you can find them, but uh, then you think uh, what I um, kind of um, uh, liked about your presentation, that you can see the uh, basketball going on that you somehow recognize uh, also in your life and in a way somehow I uh, some, sometimes when I see the, these kind of uh, like stories where there are guns, uh, dead people and everything that I cannot find the uh, I can feel and I can feel kind relate, of a pain, but I cannot relate yeah. in a way uh, but here like I can see your football and so no, basketball so I, I, I was just thinking yes yeah. Is it a, like is it it's it, it's a good way of how to get inside? For example, me who is living somewhere totally else in a different place in a different world, and that yeah. doesn't uh, get like to see it every day. And uh, yeah, that's just a comment. So no, but I, I completely agree, and I totally understand what you mean. That it 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 can be extremely difficult to relate to to stories which is going on in the other side of the world, and which has related. I mean. There's every year there's collections of money for people who are, have either been in a hurricane or an earthquake or famine or whatever. And, and we are asked about this constantly and, and we are used to looking at, at poverty and, and starvation and all these things. And then all of a sudden comes a story about women who are, who are playing basketball and, and I, I completely understand that, that you can relate to that. And, 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 you know, what is really interesting is that, uh, I mean, I've won eight World Press Awards and, and photographers are, you know, a lot of photographers think that this story by far is the, is the worst story that I won with in terms of the photography, you know. Photographers are not, no different than anyone else, you know. They, you know, they want to impress each other with the kind of photography bullshit you know, but at the end of the day, it's not about photographers taking pictures to show other photographers that they are good photographers. Photographers take pictures to tell stories to the public. And, and, and so I don't really care about that other photographers think that this story is not my best photography ever. What I care about is it's by far the story that I won with in World Press that got the biggest... Uh, impact or had the biggest impact on viewers because people can relate to it and 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 that you know at the end of the day that's what is that's what's important is that you know i don't go somewhere and and put myself through a lot of dangers and post traumatic post traumatic stress and all all these things to take a picture to impress paul or stefan you know i go there to tell stories to the public, and I know they do the same, uh, and that's what's important, you know? Anyway, we can continue this talk afterwards, it's a long talk. And now I'll show you some more pictures. Uh, the other book that I'm working on right now is a book uh, which has been, again, it's, it's war-related, it's a book about uh, the Danish Queen's soldiers, uh, her personal, it's called her lifeguards. It's, don't compare it to lifeguards as on the beach, but her personal soldiers. And when they are not, 
uh, when they are not standing outside the castle in Denmark, they actually have a big a battalion fighting in Afghanistan, in Helmand province. And a lot of these guys are tattooed. And these tattoos means a lot in terms of the war. I mean, they're all war related. It's, it, they're related to their friends that they lost during the battles. Is related to actual battles where they were injured or wounded. Uh, and I decided to do a portrait book on these guys. So it, it shows pictures of tattoos. And then to, to each picture is actually an interview uh, expressing the meaning of the tattoo, why they had them made, etc., etc. But this is just a short outtake. This book will be out in September. And again, my computer is not really in a good mood. So um, these, this is one of the first guys. Uh, it says, on the, I mean, a lot of them are obviously in Danish. It says, "Fight for what you, what you fight for what you love." even if you have to die for it. Uh, and if you die, death is not so bad. Death isn't that bad either, as long as you're proud and honor, honor for the fallen. I mean, one of the big problems with this story is actually to get the access, because these guys are really, really private, and, are not, and a lot of the tattoos are obviously very private as well. This is a Muslim guy. It says, only God can judge me which is quite interesting. His, I mean, he let me photograph him. He told the story. Uh, but his mother didn't know he was in Afghanistan fighting. She thought he was with the, uh, with the sailors, uh, the Danish Marine, sailing around the world. She didn't know she, he was in Afghanistan. It's a hand grenade, and it says, uh, hold tight. Oh, hold on. This guy tried to commit suicide twice uh, because of uh, yeah, post-trauma. But uh, he's on his third tour there now. This guy is uh, uh, part of the Secret Service. These, uh, the birds are ravens, which is from the Nordic mythology. Ravens are, uh, are known to be locust birds flying around to, get to collect intelligence. There's a lot of Nordic mythology in it. This is the field priest. It says in the small light writing up there, it says, let the small children come to me in that you cannot prevent them. This is actually the commander of the Danish camp. Uh, this is uh, when they bake cake. It's a cross. <laughs> this, is the, this is called the gogetilt, which is a strange word. But what it, it basically means is it's uh, the masturbation tent. This is where all the soldiers go to, to masturbate. So they, they raise the flag with a little pick. When, they, when it's occupied. And it's the truth. It's, it's by far the best tent in the camp because it has air condition and everything. I mean, boys are boys, huh? This is Viking Koi. This is from the last tour. Now it's ISAF 15, which is the last tour of the Danish soldiers. So it's kind of special that, that, that it's the last team of Danish soldiers there now. And they are in Helmand province, which is Pashtun country, die-hard Pashtun Taliban country. And a lot of them has this uh, amadillo in the, I mean, the, in the middle you see the star, which is the, the symbol of the Queen's Royal Guard. And the armadillo is because of a, of a soldier who was killed on ISAF-4, uh, who's kind of known to be one of the 
the biggest warriors Denmark have had in many, many years. He was killed. And so they, a lot of them in, honor of, in his honor has the armadillo uh, tattooed. Again, this is the, the star or the sun, as they call it. This is the memorial plate of the fallen Danish soldiers. We, Denmark lost 42 soldiers there, and compared to the amount of Danish soldiers who've been in the country and, and the amount of debt, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the countries who lost the most. Highway 1, Kabul, Kandahar. Camp Bastion which is now the biggest, one of the biggest military bases in the world. Uh, there's more than 30,000 soldiers there. And even though the Danes and uh, the Brits and other countries are leaving, the Americans are keeping the base um, because strategically it's very important for them in terms of Iran, Afghanistan, other countries in the region. Relaxing. So, I mean, the book will be a mixture between the portraits and the tattoos and then the, the daily life of the camp. The queen. He lost his best friend uh, in, the, in, a, in a huge IED explosion. And I mean, the stories that they tell are really, really disgusting. It's really violent stories. And the way that they tell them uh, sometimes make it, makes it even worse because it's people who are very close to them. And at the same time, they tell it like it was, I went to buy two liters of milk yesterday, kind of. And as you can see, it's also very nationalistic. This guy was injured. Uh, so on the other arm, he has a bird flying and a watch stating the time of when, when uh, he was wounded and the cave of Jesus where the, the, the stone is being moved away and uh, yeah, well, something from the Bible, shit. This is Denmark, as we know it, huh? Relaxing. <laughs> and the chess game here on his, uh, on his, which is the interesting part of this tattoo, it says, uh, it, it costs a lot of peasants to play chess. And these are all officers uh, photographed in Denmark. This is an officer of the, a captain actually in the Danish army. And uh, here it's in, uh, in the officer's mess at uh, at the Amalian Bowl where the Queen is living. So it, it took kind of a persuasion, you know, slightly difficult to persuade him to, to strip down in, uh, in the house of the Queen. Here again, this is an intellig intelligence officer, so he had to be anonymous.
This is the extra life from Mario Brothers because he was, uh, he was wounded and he survived, so we had the Mario Brothers <laughs> extra life to do it. These are called the Wrecker Boys. They all have the wolf and the lightning. They are known to be the ones who went through the most difficult things there, or the most fighting. Second battalion. This is a forward operating base which was under attack for three, three weeks constantly where the, quite a few Danish soldiers were killed, so he had that tattooed. These are two brothers who went there. They both have this, they both have this tattoo on the back. And on top it's their last name and then it's uh, this one. This is the Sangers, uh, the Towers. This is a guy, a young guy called Thomas. He was, uh, after 21 days there, he was, uh, he was the gunner in this car. And they drove upon an IED, so he had the entire scene actually tattooed. It's him lying there, badly wounded, and he barely survived. But he, he had this uh, tattoo made out of many different uh, photographs from the actual scene, so he had it all tattooed on his, on his body now. Here after a patrol in Helmand. It's really warm there now and humid in, in the green zone, so once they get back, they just drop their pants and sit and relax before going back to the camps. Reading porn magazines, which is not allowed for the Danish army. This guy got wounded in the leg. It's him again. and returning fire after he was hit. And then we're relaxing again. And this, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if you've seen the film where the US Special Forces are trying to catch Osama. But anyway, the special forces, they have these night goggles with four eyes on it. And these guys saw this movie the day before the patrol, so he made them out of toilet rolls and, and uh, duct tape, you know, because he thought it looked so cool. So he was running around <laughs> with those. Again, a very high-ranking Danish officer. This is Valhall. And uh, the girlfriend, uh, or a w woman who used to be, uh, her, go her boyfriend was killed a year and a half ago. Uh, so she had her, his a flower and his dog tag number tattooed. Here again, a Danish captain who was been accused of, uh, of uh, several war crimes, who is now actually living in uh, Guatemala and is waiting for his trial. And basically what he has on his arm is himself tattooed walking across a graveyard with five crosses and, and then he is carrying the dog tags of the five soldiers that he lost on his platoon in his hand. Oops. And here again, it's a picture of Iraq, sorry, of Afghanistan and then the Danish flag with the wolves. And here is uh, the Reike boys with the car that got blown up. It has been taken back to Denmark. Yeah. So 
So that's that's a part of this book. And again, you know, what is really interesting in this is, of course, the stories or the portrait stories related to the pictures more than it's actually the pictures in themselves. Oh, we still have some time, huh? What time do we have to stop? Half. Half? Pfft, no way. We'll just. Con I'll show you a, a, f a few things. This is basically just. Uh, I mean, some of them is from Somalia, you already saw them, but I'll just show you this quickly. This is uh, some of the other work that I've done. Here it's from the earthquake in, uh, in Kashmir some years back. This is uh, very close to the epicenter in Patika. Uh, I crossed the bridge several times. This bridge was used to carry up over, you know, uh, wounded and dead people and people who were... Uh, uh, relief aid was pretty scary to cross that bridge and I can't imagine doing it with 50 kilos on my back or with uh, wounded rel relatives. A picture that I really enjoy and which has also gotten a lot of comments and uh, won a lot of awards internationally and for me it's special because children has this amazing ability to survive and adapt even in very very bad situations and you know it constantly surprises me how fast it goes. I mean, how they are able to play even in the worst situations. She broke both, both her legs and her hips. Uh, and because there was a balloon in the room as well, she just started laughing and smiling. The hairdress in Balakot, you know. This is from Haiti. Paul and I was actually together in Haiti. These are uh, refugees. Actually, I think we were together this morning, huh? Not together, together. Oh. I mean, not that like that, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are people trying to leave uh, Port-au-Prince, but the, the harbor was blocked by the U.S. Coast Guard. Again, in the streets of, uh, of Port-au-Prince. That one you saw. That, I mean, this is, I love this picture. It's special for me because it's a school being rebuilt in the background. Uh, and they're really trying to open more schools in the country. And then this uh, Russian illusion machine was just lying in the street. Uh, basically, it was shut down by the uh, Al-Shabaab. And then when the crew survived the first crash, they went back to Russia to pick up uh, spare parts to go and fix the first plane. So when they came in with the second plane, it was shut down and everybody died. That's Somalia for you. This is a guy who was uh, in a mental hospital. Basically, everyone who are mentally ill in the country are heavily, heavily over-medicated with, with drugs, which has run out of, you know, expired, and nobody really knows what they're giving them, so people just got really, you know, even more sick. Again, a situation which is quite unique from Somalia, uh, people actually holding hand. I have never, I only seen it this one time, and I couldn't focus. I focused on the beach. Jesus Christ. A boy, when he arrived in, in Mogadishu, uh, the very day they arrived as refugees, a, a huge bomb went off in the Bakara market and he lost his sight and had shrapnel in the eye. Again, this is uh, Afghanistan. These are German intelligence officers taking off in Faisabad, Kabul. And this is a small story actually I shot in Kabul uh, in December last year. Uh, another story that I'm really interested in and that I'm working on everywhere that I go, which is that it's, there's an estimate right now that more than 20 million people around the world are living of garbage. That's whatever keeps them living. So whenever I go somewhere else or somewhere new, I photograph people living of other people's garbage. And this is from the outskirts of Kabul. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, orphaned childs, orphanage, uh, orphaned childs who lost their parents in the war. And I mean, this guy, if he was not collecting garbage in, in uh, Kabul, you know, he should have been an actor, huh? What a beautiful man. Yeah, well, you saw that. So that, you saw that, you saw that, that. No reason to look at that. I love that picture. This is from uh, the former Russian uh, cultural uh, institute in Kabul. These are drug addicts. This is from the, the riots in Hong Kong, sorry, in Bangkok, uh, on the final day when, uh, when the army went in and kicked out the, the red shirts. 
This is from my book in Darfur. These are IDPs, in internally displaced people hiding in the bushes. The border between uh, Chad and Darfur. This is the dried out river. Refugees uh, on the border trying to get out of Darfur. Also Darfur. This is uh, one of the biggest refugee camps in the world, also in Darfur. This is a baobab tree or a devil's tree, which is it's called the devil's tree because they say the root is growing upwards and the, and the actual tree downwards. A grandmother with a child while the mother is out collecting firewood. This is the picture I was talking about before when it was in color. The colors were so amazing. That was why I called it a fashion conflict. This is from, uh, from uh, Gaza Strip, from Rafa, during the big bombardments a few years back. Also from Gaza City, a mother who just dug out her four dead children. Yeah, you saw that one. This is from Sierra Leone, border between Sierra Leone and Liberia. Chechnya. The genocide in Rwanda. A burial in uh, Ramallah in the West Bank. Uh, Right-wing extremist Jews in Hebron, uh, protected by the the Israeli border patrol, which is uh, you know really feared because they are not really soldiers, they're not really police, and very dangerous guys. A father having a visit in Iraq by his two uh, children and uh, his mother and his wife. He was imprisoned for a bombing. Women chopping down trees. What, basically what happened in Darfur was that many of the refugee camps were surrounded by the Janjaweed militias. So when women went out of the camps, they got raped and attacked by, by the Janjaweed. So they tried to go out in groups in order not to be attacked. The men didn't go out at all because they would just be killed immediately. It was a really fierce uh, attack and a, a very, very bad war in terms of that. Kabul, Somalia. This is again the, these actually boys playing in the, in the dump outside uh, Kabul. They found a toy gun and then they started killing each other with it. That's why they're laughing. Again here, and this is one of the pictures from uh, from the girl's plane. And she was actually flirting with me, and a woman flirting in Mogadishu with a white photographer. I mean, I mean, it's easier to win in the lottery. Yeah, well, fuck it. You've seen, and now we have to stop. Okay, thanks.